I just wanted to start really, first of all, with um, Sasha. I mean, in terms of CBRE Global Investors, um, just talk me through a little bit in terms of um, the global strategy that, that you've just brought through. It was a, a labor of love, but it was lots of uh, tears and sweat uh, in it as well. Uh, so because we are such a big uh, investment manager, we sort of go, through, uh, you know, we, we cover all sorts of uh, real assets from infrastructure to real estate and private and listed and value add and core strategies, uh, you know, and debt and so on. So it was quite a challenge to come up with something that really speaks across all regions. Uh, across our various stakeholders, you know, be, be it the tenants or our own employees or our clients, of course, which are most institutional investors. Um, so we took quite a while to uh, really investigate what is material for the business. Uh, uh, what is, uh, what are those issues within the sustainability or ESG, if you like, uh, and there are very many of them, uh, where, where our, you know, our teams and our clients really care about. Uh, and where we, uh, through you know the, the particular type of assets that we manage, can actually have a, a significant impact. Uh, so ultimately, we came to this solution, which I think is, is quite elegant. Of uh, you know climate, of course, we we want to uh, mitigate climate change, but also uh, uh, bearing in mind that we manage real assets. You know they need to be physically resilient as well. Um, uh, people, uh, so uh, you know, both in organizational terms and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also well-being, and it's really skyrocketed uh, at the top of the agenda with, with the COVID crisis and, and how you know indoor environment can support people's well-being. Uh, and the last but not least is the what we call influence, but it's really collaboration and engagement. Um, it with the tenants or our supply chain or you know clients industry you know things like this uh, it, it all comes under influence just helping things move move along because we can't do this on our own okay super um and just just bringing that point up um i mean can can, can I pick up with you, Asim, and just, uh, I mean, th there was the point there about that the health crisis has created a greater focus. Um, do you see this remaining post-pandemic and how's that influencing your strategy at the bank? I'm not sure if I, if I understood your, your question, to be honest. Um, is the uh, I was surprised to see that uh, during the pandemic, the, the ESG um, issue was in the center of, a, of many of our clients' uh, um, preoccupations. Um, you know, usually when it comes to to uh, to uh, a economic difficult times, then uh, um, uh, it's uh, the, the ESG issue in the past was sort of a, a luxury uh, theme. However, it, it's now I think it's well in in uh, arrived in the people's. Um, in, in the business uh, uh, of the real estate industry, and we've, uh, we 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 accompany our, our clients into that those ESG um, themes and the, uh, those efforts through um, incentivizing um, uh, 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 ESG relevant uh, you know, funding. So one the, the first step that we undertook was uh, many years ago already, and also creating the Green Fund Reef was to uh, incentivizing uh, investment into uh, green buildings. Uh, having said this, now this is sort of a, 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 a sort of a standard procedure. All the new buildings are, are basically green. I'm simplifying, but, but uh, uh, in many jurisdictions, this has become uh, uh, um, obligatory, uh, um, also uh, pushed by, by legislation. Now, this, the second phase, I think, is now interesting, and, and now we'll come to a third uh, uh, phase. The second phase is to transforming what is today still grey into green. And uh, so, a, a, um, uh, notwithstanding any, 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 uh, any certificates, to um, incentivize uh, investments into, into the existing uh, uh, buildings to become green. That we will, would call transformation um, facilities or transitional facilities elsewhere. And the third thing I would uh, will be very interesting to see how we can manage this as an industry. The cradle to cradle um, um, output 
can we really get a grasp on on CO two footprints from its uh, from the, the the start of its production to the destruction? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, and uh, I, I want to pick up with you, um, James, just in just in terms of um, the trends. Obviously, you're watching those. Have you seen some of the kind of acceleration, James, that that's been talked about? Uh, no, absolutely. From our from our perspective, um, you know, seeing uh, throughout the the sort of the COVID period over the last year or so, just the the increase in appetite and interest in in ESG related matters. Um, you know, of course, we we weren't sure whether it was going to amplify or or, or you know or reduce. Um, you know, and have seen it coming through really really strongly in this period. So yeah, it's it's. It's become it's become very quickly, a, a, you know, a key topic for discussion, uh, you know, amongst other people as well who aren't already on the journey. When we've got people on the panel here who are well, well on the, you know, well on the journey, but um, seeing more and more, more and more funds coming through with with asset classes that traditionally wouldn't have been doing some of these things. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, let, let's just pick up a little bit. Um, also on the on some of the sectors um, and Clemens I just wanted to come to you obviously Redev Coactive uh, you know across various sectors mixed use um, uh, but also you know a, a lot of retail there um, I suppose how do you see the challenges in terms of the sectors that, that you're working in? Yeah I think it's clear that that uh, the, the past year has been uh, uh, a very volatile one, uh, unprecedented times, um, and I think we're all still um, trying to get to grips with with how to navigate through this and, and how it will impact our uh, you know the retail sector, the retail real estate sector, and whether it's something that is structural or whether this is just a, a temporary blip in the road uh, and, and how things uh, may revert back uh, uh, you know as, as we kind of climb out of the um, the health crisis um, I think from our perspective we still strongly believe in the power of, of inner cities we still believe that human beings are by nature social creatures uh, that they, they like uh, shopping they want to shop um, and so there is, of course, still a uh, a real um, you know, relevance and need for the right kind of retail space, uh, you know, in in our cities and and in you know well located, uh, even out of town uh, locations. Um, the question will just be, of course, you know, how do you make sure that that you curate those in a way that uh, you're delivering something that is, is speaking to the changing uh, habits of consumers. They are more informed. They, they of course, uh, you know, are digitally enabled. Uh, they will quite easily, um, you know, also choose the e-commerce channels. Um, so you, you have to offer something uh, that is appealing, and that's that's something that, as a, as a real estate manager, as a landlord, uh, you can help facilitate. But you have to do it together with your uh, retailing tenants and the occupiers, uh, and that's the, I guess, the exciting challenge for the next. Um, you know, uh, five to ten years to see how that will evolve. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see the evolution and also just, um, you know, as more investors come on board. Um, I mean, certainly, I mean, Asim, from your perspective, do you see this really growing? I mean, I know there's a lot of um, finance initiatives around there, but we've also seen, you know, increased regulation from the EU coming through, and one would expect that to be followed around the rest of the world as well. Um, so, do you see more of your business heading in this in this direction, really? Oh, definitely. Well, we, we, first of all, the um, we we are um, uh, defining the precise targets for ourselves. So, so that's already. A, a certain focus on on that kind of financing. Um, where uh, one of our targets is uh, to give you an example that we want a third of our portfolio to be eligible for green financing uh, at, uh, in 2025. Another target is that we want to to have a, a complete CO2 transparency on a, on a, on a, on our portfolio. We want to know at any given time how much CO2 is coming from, from the portfolio that we are financing. 
Um, so so th there's an there's a internal dimension and there's the external dimension where we see our, our, our clients uh, um, focusing on, on, on green and, and energy efficient assets or transforming them, as I, as I, as I mentioned. As, you, as, we, as we know, um, the, the Parisian uh, uh, targets uh, that we aim for in 2050 would mean that we transform 3% uh, uh, per annum uh, of, of existing stocks. So um, having said this, we know that in big countries like France or Germany, uh, we only transform 1% uh, of, uh, of existing stock per year. So that means that we that the transition will have to pick up speed, and that we that it's it's going to be an exponential curve to to uh, if we want really want to uh, um, get to the 2050 targets that we set ourselves. Yeah, and that's and that's a big target. I mean, just in terms of. I mean, because much like you see um, in most countries across Europe, um, the, the 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 target set for uh, for building new residential and it never being built, and the target's getting even bigger and bigger. Is this is this a, a problem area for us? I mean, Sasha, from from your point of view, how achievable are these things, and what needs to happen to to actually reach some of these targets that Asim was talking about there? Uh, well, in, in setting our strategy and our vision, we really went into detail uh, on this specific um, topic, because if you set a target and you, you know, come out and say we're going to be net zero carbon by 2040, you better know what you're talking about. Um, so <laughs> that's why it took so long. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we have like two different strategies depending on the investment strategy uh, of the portfolio. Uh, where if we have a you know a core portfolio, uh, the objective is to hold and manage a green asset, uh, and it, you know it, it will take time to get there. It, we're not saying we're going to be in a zero carbon tomorrow. Uh, we need to look at every asset and have a, a, a action plan for every specific asset, and then build that into the asset building plan, which will be linked to the normal investment uh, life cycle. You know the tenants, events, whatever it might be. You know there's so many factors that go into that. So we will improve this asset, you know, in in a way that uh, also protects. Um, value uh, and you know we, we provide uh, we, pro we support institutional investors so you know pensioners are depending on, on us uh, doing our job properly so it has to be thought out it's it's a process rather than a uh, overnight thing and then for uh, value add uh, portfolios which is really either um, uh, it's it's either uh, uh, upfront development. Um, uh, investment, or or you would uh, buy a distressed asset and um, you know a, a building that doesn't perform very well, and turn it around, reposition it, and, and then pass it on. So in those, it's actually this delta uh, that that we uh, look at. So you know what is you know we need to create uh, in in uh, in simple terms, create an asset that a court portfolio would like to have. Right, so that asset needs to be future proof. While we hold it in, you know, it's, again, it's, it depends on, you know, the tenancy and all sorts of lease events and, and so on. While we hold the asset, it might not be brilliant, actually, by definition, it's not going to be brilliant. But once we sort of reposition it, that asset is going to be future ready and zero carbon, if it makes sense. Uh, so the combination of two um, um, are really needed. And of course, if it's a forward uh, forward funding, then, uh, you know, you put these requirements uh, up front. Uh, but as Asim said, you know, it's, it's really about um, dealing with these existing buildings. You know, the, what, what is the statistic? I think is there is 80% uh, of buildings that will be around in 2050 are already here. Uh, especially in European countries, that we we have such a such a um, old, if you like, built environment that there's value in it. Of course, historical value and cultural value, uh, and embodied carbon, frankly, <laughs> sunk into it. Uh, but we do need to turn around um, um, those buildings. That that's the more more important thing. Uh, building ourselves out of climate crisis is not really an option. So we need to deal with the existing stuff. Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, there's a question that's uh, that's come in from from Gregor. Thanks for that, Gregor. Um, given the multinational background of the panel, what does the panel think about the future importance of voluntary versus regulatory change and different approaches between the EU taxonomy, SFDR focus on disclosure and sustainability activity, and the Anglo-Saxon focus on certification and ambitious voluntary commitments? Um, 
Uh, interesting, quite a quite a complex question there, but but I, <laughs> but it'd be interesting to get people's views on uh, on those two aspects of the voluntary side, especially, um, uh, and and also that that kind of regulatory, you know, th those differences of approaches. Does anybody have a have a view on that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so. Uh, my, I'm, I'm a long suffering green assessor actually, so I sort of come from a construction industry where I was sort of, we were developing uh, assets and, and you know had to certify them and so on. So I sort of know it from you know the very early design days all, all the way to the the actual handover. Uh, and my impression from from the experience there is that uh, you know the uh, the extra ambitious and and the leaders are always going to be leaders and extra ambitious. And for them, yes, it's nice to have a certification to confirm. Uh, uh, what they have achieved, but they will always go for these voluntary things and, you know, go over and above, but they are a minority. Um, in order to get uh, everyone to move along, uh, you do need uh, regulations and they need to, um, you know, the basic requirements and they need to continually uh, push, you know, the, the behind, if you like. Uh, so, um, it, in terms of you know the process and you know yes of course it's 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 a burden but if you know i haven't heard anybody uh, complaining that financial audit takes too long or it shouldn't be so long and detailed uh, you know it's the same for esg data and esg assessments you know i i want to know that the asset that got certified got properly audited um and that the data that i'm getting is is correct so that i can then look what to do next with it um, so yes, it is an audit and it's uh, painful, but yeah, that's um, that's life. James, you wanted to pick that up as well. Uh, yeah, if I could uh, could offer a reflection on that. I mean, I think you know, uh, Sasha just now was talking about the volume of existing buildings that you know that we need to that we need to improve. Um, and I think you know that that's one of the key points here. I mean, certainly in, in my my experience more recently whilst in, if we think about BREAM certification, because that's the one that I'm more familiar with, of course, um, I would say that the UK market is very strong for our new construction certification, but actually in terms of existing buildings and BREAM in use and improvement of assets, actually in existing building improvements, I would say that the European market has been stronger uh, you know, over the last few years that I've been that I've been working in this area, if I reflect on you know the work that that Redevco have done and Sasha's done, um, you know, with CBRE and then the the take in Sweden and, and France, the French market, uh, you know, much higher on the existing asset improvement. So I would I would challenge that the point that was made in a way. I don't. I don't think that there's resistance to certification in in Europe, and I think that people are seeing the value in these processes. And and of course, just to finish off, um, you know, Sasha's point around the audit, um, it, to stand to, to to stand up to scrutiny and be a third party and and to mean something, you know, it's it's got it's got to be done properly. Um, and with the rise of non-financial and financial reports coming out on the same day now in, in some in, in some REITs, you know, this is probably the pathway that we're going to need to take so we can pull through the the huge volume of assets that are not in real estate funds as well to make the improvements to those. OK, good. Um, I mean, there was a lot of discussion in the in the session um, this morning as well about um, you know whether or not SFDR would get rid of impact washing as well as green washing. Um, Clemens, what's what's your sense of that in terms of regulation? I mean, I know at Redevco you've you've been trying to get in many ways ahead of the regulation um, because you've been driving this um, you know low carbon strategy for for quite a considerable while. Um, but how do you see the regulatory side? Do you see that as positive? Do you do you encourage more of this regulation to help drive it forward? Yeah, thanks, uh, Richard. I think what it comes down to is, as far as I'm concerned, at least, is that, um, you know, maybe finally also uh, European institutions and national governments are also waking up to the uh, the urgency with which we need to start tackling this this challenge. Um, you know, it's, it's great that we have had uh, industry leaders uh, that have voluntarily, you know, raised the bar 
uh, try to lead, uh, try to use the, the tools and the methodologies that are out there to uh, to make progress and uh, and to demonstrate what's possible. But um, it, you know, the last couple of years, it has become hugely uh, you know apparent, and it's, it's received a lot of uh, press coverage that you know we're into the, the the decade in which we will determine the future of our planet, uh, to put it mildly, and and so we have to sort of start taking some bold action. And from that perspective, I think it's fantastic to see that the legislation, the regulatory environment is uh, is upping its game, um, which will force you know all market participants to uh, to take this seriously and to to you know make sure that they're you know properly thinking through what their responsibility is, um, you know getting the data they need to to be able to report transparently, and you know let's not forget we don't have to be perfect tomorrow. Right. It's it's also about setting a baseline uh, today, uh, and even if only ten percent of your fund is you know environmentally sustainable, that's fine. It's about how over the next 10, 20 years you push that to 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, and I think that's really where uh, you know taxonomy, SFDR, TCFD, whatever you want to call it, it's all kind of nudging you know, market players in the same direction. And I think if we can get more convergence on, uh, you know, the right methodologies and tools uh, to do that, then that's a good thing. And, you know, from our perspective, you know, we also made a commitment uh, end of 2019 to work towards a net zero carbon portfolio. Um, you know, we did all the, the, the homework as well to figure out what's it going to take. Uh, you know, we're not there today either. Uh, we have another 20 years, but it is about at asset level, at the moments when you can, intervening, making deliberate choices and uh, and seeing what the impact of that is on your energy intensity, on your carbon intensity, uh, reporting on it transparently. And uh, yeah, and over time, that track record will, will, uh, will speak for itself. Okay, good. And I mean, SM, do you see the transformation part of it um, as the kind of largest section in a way um, and that that's where financing has got to step in and be able to you know be able to support um, investors to be able to transform some of these assets given that the majority of the assets are standing assets and, and need improvement yeah uh, I want to pick up what what uh, Sasha uh, said before I mean 80 percent of the buildings that we that will be relevant in for the two 50 uh, climate uh, goals are already existent. So, so yes, that's definitely a role that we as a lender can play to help our clients to transform the, uh, the, those, those buildings, make it financially, economically more viable uh, by, um, uh, for example, uh, lowering a, a, a margin on a loan. And that's, that's what we're, we're aiming to do. Of course, as a lender, we don't have the direct impact on, on the building. We can only um, incentivize our clients to, to do what is necessary. And, and that's the, the role that we see us playing, incentivizing and helping our, our clients to, to, to go down the, the, this route. Yes, it's definitely the existing building which will um, be decis decisive in the, in the battle for, uh, uh, for the climate neutrality. Okay, good. Um, and James, just in terms of um, valuations and those kinds of things. Uh, are you beginning to see some shifts in that? I mean, we've, I've been having discussions over the past couple of weeks where the idea of valuations beginning to change, reflect, you know, there being different ways of valuing, which pick up um, not just the, the, the sustainability side, but also the social impact side, those kinds of things. Um, are you seeing that discussion happening more, James, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's certainly an emerging emerging topic, um, something that we're seeing more having more conversations around. Um, you know, in a similar way to to the plea around a sort of a harmonised set of standards, and 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 not having a proliferation of, of different ways to do things, having a consistent set of you know measurement standards that are applied across the board that onboard sustainability measures into that is is absolutely paramount um you know just just through my own experience out of outside of bre at the weekends i'm actually building three net zero houses using the passive house standard um and uh the reason i mention it is not you know it's because I, I decided it was time to show that i wanted to put my money where my mouth is around climate change but actually getting the lenders 
and the value is to understand some of the sustainability principles of that process has been difficult. Um, but then we, we move quickly into conversations with lenders who will be offering a production in, in basis points or interest rate, you know, at the right levels of sustainability. So it is shifting, but there's still plenty to do. <laughs> OK, good. Um, and, and Sasha, just just from just from your point of view, um, how are people seeing it at the moment? Um, do you see it as I mean, there's a lot of discussion around that, you know, there is a cost to all of this. And at a certain point, somebody has got to pay that, whether that is uh, governments accepting that in terms of, you know, investing more or providing investment packages or whatever it might be to help do that or investors have to accept that there is you know the embedded carbon is going to cost them somewhere along the line um how do you see that and how, what's the discussion like within cbre global investors about the value that's being added and and how you're actually going to transform that and where that value comes from uh, you've got to try there it's it's added value actually uh, you know the one of the biggest changes in the past uh, i'd say 18 months uh, is this view of sustainability so back after credit crunch uh, uh, all traces of sustainability were well engineered and we were actually protected uh, by regulations to at least keep the minimum um, uh, where we are right now is that he, he actually ESG uh, is seen as a safe haven uh, for investment I and mean, it is a risk management and a value add opportunity. So what you know our, our whole vision is based on the belief that uh, actually uh, ESG supports uh, financial outperformance rather than uh, damages that. And we are seeing more and more um, evidence of that in practice. You know the assets that we turn around, uh, you know, and then a really exemplar. Uh, in ESG performance are seeing, you know, higher occupancies or, you know, better liquidity and, you know, it's, it's really quite remarkable, uh, uh, this difference. And as well, you're seeing that, you know, as, as we look at uh, assets to acquire, um, uh, we are doing the assessment of what is needed to turn this asset into uh, into a green building, into something we want to operate, and that is built into, if you like, the, the previous question on valuation. So uh, it might not be in the valuation, but we make an assessment of the costs, and then that goes into the overall uh, assessment and the IC. Um, so, you know, maybe there is an, a little bit of uh, upfront cost in some cases, but we feel that, you know, over the life cycle of the building and, all, you know, how we invest, it's, it's not, uh, you know, in, in five minutes, um, these things, uh, you know, you, you get a payback, actually. Uh, it's difficult to say, well, uh, okay, this fantastic building in the middle of a fantastic city, um, you know, uh, in great location, the rest of it, you know, we have made it super green. What is the percentage uh, that the green uh, brought for for the you know increase in value? That is where the trick is, you know. So we know that there is a positive correlation, but how much uh, goes, you know, because it's uh, green or because it's certified and so on? Uh, it, it's really difficult to extract that from the all the other um, uh, circumstances around the building. Uh, but again, yeah, uh, we, we I do have to uh, have conversations still, especially you know depending on the region. Um, you know, so, some people still see sustainability as a cost rather than as an opportunity. Uh, so there is quite a bit of education that needs to go into that. But you know, all these examples that we're getting and you know sort of on a portfolio and an asset level are really helping change the minds. And then ultimately, if you don't do it, uh, I think you know your, your question around how it's going to be financed. Um, I think we're going to be taxed. Um, there will be carbon tax, and you know, if you, it's it's uh, you, are, you either you sort of improve something and do what you you're supposed to do right now, or you're going to be penalised. So um, it's uh, it, I don't see how how else uh, uh, transition can be you know properly pushed and and financed other than the tax. Okay, I'm going to pick that up in in a second. Um, uh, Asam, in, in 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 your sense, I mean, as a bank, you know, as well as investors, you're having to look at the risk, the resilience of an asset. Um, are there a danger in general that there will be some assets that are simply stranded um, that have very little value going forward because there's not that much that can be done with them? Um, how much of a risk is that overall for the for the real estate sector? Well, I think it's it's uh, that risk is is um, as as a session just uh, hinted at. It's, it's difficult to assess today, but it will be it will in, increase throughout the time. 
we, you, we, you, you see investors um, uh, such as, for example, Allianz, who uh, uh, talked about it in, in, in one of the real estate uh, journals uh, three weeks ago, who said, we will not buy any building anymore that has not the capacity of, of, of being transformed into a, a green building. So um, more and more investors, I think, will go down this, this route. And uh, once you have, having said this, you, you will there, there will be a, a discount um, on the, the values because of the lack of liquidity of this, these kind of assets. Then you have regulations such as in, in the Dutch market, uh, a certain certificate uh, um, is required to to get it to to to, to remain operational um, beyond 2023. And you know, and, and those who do not comply with that uh, um, regulation will will not be uh, viable economically speaking. And so um, they will be, as you said, stranded. So we are assessing um, uh, those risks more and more, and we are uh, forming a view that uh, maybe this the uh, an asset which will not comply with these with these criteria will not be uh, financeable in in the future. Okay, so that could play a really important role, actually. There. Yes. Um, and and Clements, from from your point of view, pick up any of the points that that have, have come up already, of course. Um, but from your point of view, in terms of the selection of assets, um, is your preference to turn around these assets generally, or are you really moving to sort of a view of well, actually, will sell the assets where we don't think there's an interesting turnaround case and just you know buy new ones in order to to maintain the portfolio i mean uh, you know how on a practical level i suppose what are the things that you've set out that you're planning to do to help reach the targets you've set yeah so maybe just briefly also reflecting on the point about is is you know sustainability a cost or an investment um you know totally with sasha on on that that it, uh, it it does still get seen occasionally as a as a cost uh we're also clearly of the opinion that it's uh, absolutely an investment that uh, that does generate a return uh, and will get paid back at some point in the future whether you see it in today's valuation uh, is is uh, is definitely still um up for debate I think that's very much dependent on sector as well. Uh, you know, the examples uh, I think that uh, Sasha alluded to in, in the office sector, it's clear that it makes a difference and you see it already in uh, rents and in, and in, in you know, operating costs and, uh, and yields. In retail, you don't see it uh, as directly yet, but I'm convinced it'll come. Um, what does that mean for us in terms of, you know, how do we approach it? Uh, look, I think, you know, we also have in our kind of our own ambition statement, as it were, we also say uh, something along the lines of, you know, we want to deliberately future proof assets whilst under our stewardship. Um, now, you know, exiting assets, uh, selling assets that, that don't perform to a certain, uh, you know, EI uh, efficiency standard um, it isn't going to solve the problem for the whole sector, right? You just push the burden onto someone else. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't sell assets. Uh, of course we do, because we have to also look at, uh, you know, other criteria and other things that, that, that push our, uh, you know, mandates and our, our plans uh, fund by fund. Um, but we also don't necessarily say today that, that you know, having a certain sustainability criteria or, or level or, or performance is a filter at the front door. So we're not going to select assets uh, uh, only if they are already, uh, you know, totally compliant with, uh, with this, that or the other. I think that's a little bit part of where we have and we see an opportunity to say, you know, if you can buy it at the right price as well, yeah, then there's also some room in the coming, be it three, five, 10, 20 years to then actually deliberately future proof it, make it uh, compliant, make it, you know, at an EI level that is uh, in line with uh, the CREM pathways. Um, and and then at the end, when you do choose to sell it again, uh, uh, you know, you should have a perfectly liquid asset that someone else will happily take on in, into their portfolio. Uh, so, you know, but, but these things change, right? And I think we also work for and on behalf of uh, investor clients. And this is a conversation you have with your investor client. And if your investor says, listen, I have a certain strategy, I have a certain mandate, 
uh, and I need to liquidate my fund, uh, yeah, then we have to liquidate and that's it. So it's not something that we determine in isolation. It's always in conversation with uh, our investor clients. And of course, the actions that we do is always with the occupiers. Uh, you know, we can do certain measures. Certain measures might be the responsibility of the tenant. But, you know, that's where the business models that we've had for the past 20, 30 years. Yeah, that is also going to change. At least that's my conviction. I think we're going to have to work a lot more uh, as active asset managers uh, to really also take responsibility for certain elements of the, the, the building and, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, change the way that we interact and work with our uh, occupiers uh, to at least drive to the results that, uh, um, that, we, need to, that we need to get to. Um, it would be interesting. Um, thanks for that, Clemens. It would be interesting, James. I mean, um, in terms of the embedded carbon side, um, uh, there seems to be, you know, a growing conversation around that, that it's not just about building bright, new, shiny buildings, but actually, you know, if you're knocking down an existing building, then you've got to think about the embedded carbon and balance those things out. Um, how easy is it to pick up that within the sort of... Um, I suppose, the measurement side and begin to take more of a, a holistic view, I suppose. So, I mean, you know, it's interesting now that suddenly some of these topics have becoming ever, you know, ever more quickly to the, to the fore. Um, you know, we, we have a responsibility, of course, to try and move, move the, the schemes and the standards in, in line with, with, you know, the questions that are being asked by the market. Um, I think fundamentally for us, it's about being able to to support people in in asset by asset improvement. You know, fundamental action planning around around buildings. Um, to Sasha's point about the the valuation aspect, we uh, we were involved with a, on a study with JLL, where all other things being equal. Um, you know, the, the rental yield from a certificated certified asset was sort of 8%, up to 8% increased um, with everything else being the same. In terms of new new topics, I mean, it's the drive for you know, more insights, more benchmarking, sort of harmonisation, streamlining, cradle to cradle carbon is something uh, that people are starting to ask about. Um, whole life performance and the sort of what's the, the next generation of, 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 of BRIAM and, and other standards. You know, these are all things that we we constantly talk to to our, our stakeholders. I'm not a big fan of that word, but stakeholders um, to, about. Um, and, you know, some of the people on this panel have also helped in, in the development of this. It's an evolution and a step that we all need to take together so that we can pull the mass market, you know, of, of assets that aren't inside in, in, in you know in investment funds through as well because it's all those buildings that are owned by individuals and smaller companies where there's much smaller portfolios that were, that's where the, a huge amount of the impact also sits as well. Uh, Richard, you're on mute. <laughs> that's a new good, one. <laughs> good heavens. Six, it makes me feel better now. I, I think that's I think I think that's about 140 of these that I've done in the last <laughs> and never been on mute. And uh, and I'd like to blame entirely somebody knocking at the door and my dogs for that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to pick up. Um, th there's a focus around build back better. That's a sort of topic that, that keeps appearing. Um, and I, I suppose. I just wanted to get some practical examples in a way of, of what we can do, what investors, what the people watching this can do um, joining the session. What does that mean in terms of, of financing? What are, the, what are the strategies that are going to help deliver that really, um, Asen? It's, that's a very tough question. Well, first of all, as I said, uh, green buildings always, it's, that's an easy one. Transformation. Um, we, I think there's no, uh, for the time being, there's no certificate that would tell us how much a, a, uh, um, a uh, capex will uh, res result in, in an economy of, of CO, CO2. That's, that's actually what we're trying to, to achieve. We are measuring the, the before uh, uh, footprint and the after footprint. And if that complies with certain criteria, 
we will help our client to to in in terms of a cheaper funding. Now, um, the question that, that that you implied: Are we are we also uh, taking into consideration, for example, hybrid construction? And that's what actually um, what your 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 question I think implies. Um, that's that's difficult. We're not. Um, we're not ready yet to to really um, quantify a, a a criteria for that hybrid construction. Well, what what I can say is though that we definitely will um, uh, view very favorably um, construction that that are uh, um, taking into consideration the cradle to cradle CO two footprint to, uh, using hybrid construction methods and, and materials that will reintegrate into uh, into uh, um, other constructions once the, the building has been taken down again. So um, those kind of initiatives we are viewing very favourable. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to I wanted to just pick up um, and Sasha maybe, uh, but this is to everybody really, which is. Um, do we think, given that COP26, and I know not everybody is in is in the UK, um, but COP26 is going to be in in Glasgow, um, do we think that there is going to be a larger um, sort of representation from the real estate side, given the impact that that real estate and the built environment has? Um, on these than than before. I mean, it's it's interesting that it was it's been less of a discussion, but I'm beginning to feel that it's it's going to be more of a discussion as we build towards COP26. I don't know if anybody has a view on that. Um, well, uh, you called me on I'll, I'll start. Uh, I think it absolutely must uh, built environment. And I'm sure everybody knows the statistic that is, is responsible for about 40 percent of carbon emissions. You know, from the construction to the life cycle. Um, so if, if this country and all the other countries are going to achieve that uh, 2050 um, net zero carbon emissions, the built environment must be part of, um, you know, contribute and, and, you know, and either, you know, through voluntary means or through regulations or, or taxation or whatever it might be. Uh, so it's, it's a massive part and I think uh, it needs to it needs to be represented in, um, in, in the COP as well. Yeah, Richard, I think actually, uh, if my understanding is correct, um, the UK GPC uh, has been working very closely with uh, the COP organisation and uh, Alok Sharma, the, the, the minister who, who's now focusing exclusively on COP, uh, has already agreed to a built environment day uh, at COP. So it is definitely going to get uh, a lot of attention uh, later this year in, in, in Glasgow. Um, if I if I may, can I just quickly go back to the the, the previous question on sort of examples and and you know uh, you know practical things that that uh, you know asset managers uh, investment managers are thinking about. Um, you know, we also looked at a number of redevelopments that we did in our portfolio, uh, sort of a pre and a post analysis uh, and impact on energy intensity and carbon intensity. And we didn't actually sort of approach the development at all specifically on that topic. We actually just looked at uh, how do we improve it to a BRIAM very good. Um, and just by doing the kinds of things that you would do to achieve a BRIAM very good, uh, we actually achieved on average about a 40% uh, energy intensity uh, reduction um, through the development. Now, that, that gave me a lot of comfort around, uh, you know, also planning through our roadmap for, for net zero carbon to say, well, if you just continually raise the ambition on BRIAM and say, yeah, rather than just targeting very good, if you target excellent, and if you start to deliberately look at those elements of a, uh, a redevelopment, uh, a re retrofit, a refurb that will have impact on uh, energy consumption, uh, energy efficiency, uh, and that specifically relates to things like, you know, your insulation, your glazing, your installations, uh, whether it's yours or the tenants. Um, you know, by making that just a bit more explicit and just looking at, and using tools like BRIAM and targeting things, you know, the rating of, of excellent, you will undoubtedly get uh, a 50, 60 percent uh, reduction in energy intensity and the corresponding uh, CO2 emission uh, reductions, especially if you choose to also get off natural gas and you use uh, all electric solutions. So it's not I mean, I don't mean to sound flippant. It's not rocket science. I think we know what needs to be done. Um, it's just that, you know, all the various actors in the chain, 
uh, need to get aligned around an ambition. Um, you know, that's from the, the, I guess, the client first, uh, the architect, the advisors, uh, but also the, the, the occupiers to say we will make deliberate choices uh, to plan for, uh, you know, a redevelopment, a retrofit that will look at all these different aspects. And we will make the improvements that we need to to get onto that kind of, you know, creme compliant uh, uh, EI pathway uh, and, and corresponding reduction in, in emissions too. So there's a lot out there. I think we, you know, we just have to also kind of step out of our own comfort zones and just have the open conversations and seek out the collaboration and just do it. Yeah, I think the collaboration point is a, is a, is a really key one there. Um, we're, we're coming up to the end of the session, so I, I just wanted to, if you've got any questions, um, don't hold back now is the time. Um, um, but just as a kind of final round, um, I, I suppose we've all talked about it being an opportunity rather than um, just a cost. Um, so I guess, what do you see as the key opportunity if we're looking um, not just in 2021, but but also also beyond? Um, let's let's start with you, Sasha, J just in terms of what do you see as the as the big opportunity, I suppose, here? It's, I wouldn't pull out one aspect, you know, it, while climate is extremely important, uh, I think this, the whole environmental quality uh, of the buildings and how they fit in the local community uh, and, you know, how they're perceived, is, is incredibly important. So, you know, having that holistic view, uh, you know, not losing sight of biodiversity, of, you know, air quality, all of these things, uh, while, of course, you know, yes, carbon is, is uh, you know, the, the top topic. Uh, I think that's the, the, the real opportunity to sort of really create this holistic, um, um, you know, new built environment that, that is truly sustainable. And this is why I like certification systems, because they, they look at all of these things uh, in tandem and, and give you a good uh, assessment across the board. Super, great. Thanks very much. Um, James, let's come to you. Yeah, just a final thought. I mean, I, I, took, I was just reflecting on somebody who some, some years ago told me uh, that the new type of low energy lamps, the CFLs that we can all remember, were a 20 year overnight success story. Um, and it sort of feels a little bit in some regard around sustainability. Obviously, we, we hoped we'd never need to take such such strong action to solve this challenge. But I'm really hoping that we can use the momentum that's building even in the last you know sort of year or so to really focus much more quickly on completing the E part, but then focusing on the social impact side of things as well. So can we cover off the S more quickly than we've covered off the E previously? Just, an, just a thought, really. Great. Um, Assam, over to you. What, what, what do you see as the, the big opportunity? That's a really difficult question to, to ask a, a banker because we um, we participate in risk and not so much in opportunities, don't we? And, and I can say that um, the opportunity for investors who come to us is to, to show the sustainability of their, their, their project, either in, in social or environmental ways, but definitely in, 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 in terms of environment. And in having said this, the, the, the um, getting funding for a non-ESG compliant um, project will be increasingly difficult. Okay, great. Clemens. Yeah, I, I just think that it's a real opportunity for our sector, the built environment sector, to actually kind of surprise um, our occupiers. Um, you know, they're not the specialists. They have ever increasing demands. Uh, they don't necessarily know exactly how or what. It's our opportunity to provide that and to do that in a way that, that is uh, collaborative. It, it brings them along, it engages them. And, and maybe it impacts them in their own supply chain to also ask questions and to, to do things differently. And uh, I, I think you know that's a huge opportunity to um, to just make a, a little bit of a difference to uh, you know kind of keep our our planet inhabitable for uh, for future generations. Great, thanks very much. Really, really interesting discussion. Thanks very much for all of your kind of insights and comments. Thank you also for your questions. 
Um, you can join in with the networking after this, so um, you can connect with others with other attendees. Um, just use all of the available opportunities that there are for that. Um, tomorrow as well, we'll be looking at. Um, we'll start off at uh, ten o'clock CET, nine o'clock UK, um, with seven future trends for real estate with uh, Sean Cooley, um, and then we're also going to be looking at investments in in cities, how that's changed or or how it may change post pandemic, um, and then in the afternoon. We're, we're taking a look at uh, logistics. Um, so do feel free to, to sign up for any of those sessions for tomorrow. Look forward to seeing you then. Um, but in the meantime, thanks very much for joining us and thanks again to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Richard.